Hello and welcome to another World Anvil stream. I was about to say Sunday night stream, but of course we have laid on a special stream for our incredibly special guest, Gail Carriger. Gail, welcome. Hello, hello. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. Guys, as you know, it is Pride Month and we are celebrating LGBT plus writing. <laughs> and world building and all that good stuff. So we're gonna be focusing today on world building LGBT aspects, on how you can do that if you've never done it before, on uh, what kind of aspects you might want to dig into and um, why you might wanna be doing that. So let me introduce our very special guest quickly because she is far too modest to introduce, introduce herself. Gail <laughs> Carriger has multiple New York Times bestsellers and over a million books in print in dozens of different languages. Her parasol, particularly if you see you're drinking tea and trying to look modest, but you're amazing and we know it. <laughs> Her parasol protectorate mixes comedies of manners with urban fantasy to create exciting steampunk worlds within the pages. She was once an archaeologist. I know, all the best people were. And is fond of <laughs> shoes, octopuses and tea. The fourth book of her Custard Protocol series comes out this fall, and I think you just released a book, didn't you, Gail? I did. I just uh, I just released this book here. <gasps> uh, oh, oh, I, I don't have a, one of those screens that flips around, but uh, it's called The Fifth Gender, and it's very queer, so it's very uh, prescient for the discussion today. Perfect. And it's my first sort of serious foray into science fiction as well, so all around pretty exciting for me. Very um, exciting. I can't wait to talk about the topic. I'm I I will be asking you imminently. So um, with that, <laughs> let's dive straight in. I know that we are actually raffling off today a copy of The Fifth Gender. So guys, keep your eyes on the raffle for that. Demetrius will be giving you more information. But let's jump straight in. So Gail, your books have a lot of gender diversity and sexuality diversity represented in them. Yeah, they really do. <laughs> what moved you to do that? Like, what inspired you? Why do you think that's important? Uh, well, I'm queer, and I come from a, a queer background, I suppose you could say. I grew up in San Francisco in the 80s, um, and I grew up in a, in a sort of quasi-artist commune kind of thing. And so, honestly, it just never occurred to me not to have queer characters in my books. I was like, oh, that's just the way the world is. Uh, so that's the way my books are um I, i'm more likely to be like why not <laughs> like why aren't there queer characters uh defend yourself uh anyway so yeah that's that's basically why they're there because they're all around me so no yeah. fantastic fantastic I'm, I'm just sort of diving straight in i'm afraid yeah, um so it. uh so a lot of your books are set in the 19th century how did you reconcile the, the sort of the comedy of manners with with this more sort of shall we say out, outrageous side of of what was considered well, at least outrageous in the 19th century i have an excellent cheat well pat, putting aside the fact that there actually was quite a large especially in london queer community um mollies and toms and, and, and aka lesbians and and gay men um it was the Oscar Wilde case in 1895 that kind of pivot changed everything. So prior to that, there's there actually is, I mean, it's quite illegal and quite dangerous, but uh, there, and we know about it, and there are historical records and historical individuals and stuff that we know quite a bit about. So uh, nobody questions that, I don't think. But I, I use cheat, which is I have supernatural creatures in my books, and I make them kind of liminal to polite society, both kind of dominating polite society in terms of, sort of clothing and manners and all that sort of thing, um, and as well as politics and stuff. But also there's sort of these ancient immortals dabbling in the upper crust of England, and they are a lot more open to all kinds of sensation than the human feet that they are, humans they are feeding off of. Um, and so I can use that as, a, I can use my immortal characters as my vampires and werewolves mostly, at least in the, in the first series, as commentary on uh, sort of the actual British polite society that existed, because that's sort of the conceit of my universe is just, we take supernatural creatures that in the Western zeitgeist was invented in the Gothics of the Victorian era and stick them back into the Victorian era and make them real and see what happens. Um, and what happens is you have technological innovation and change, which brings about my steampunk technology, but you also have social and cultural innovation and change, which brings about my, uh, 
able to have conversations about kind of a queer community and queer, for lack of a better word, objectives that uh, perhaps some of my uh, characters have, <laughs> intentionally or not. Amazing, amazing. So um, do you, uh, I really love that essentially you tied all these elements together. So you said, if this, then that. Um, which is which is, is probably one of the reasons that your your universes feel so authentic and so rich. Um, do you have any advice for our, our world builders listening about that? Well, I think a lot of it for me, I mean, part of the reasons I nest so comfortably in steampunk is because, as we said, I'm an archaeologist by training. And so I think about objects as representations of culture. And I also think about history from a sort of archaeological perspective. So not... Um, necessarily how was it written down or or if one if we were writing alternate history how one event could pivot change the rest of history after that uh, which tends to be the common approach but more from an ar archaeological perspective which is if we add new evidence if we add supernatural creatures if we add dirigibles if we take away the telegraphs like those sorts of things as brain exercises what um will be the repercussions on culture so how do we re-explain the evidence Rat. And that's a very archaeological way to look at things. Every time you add new evidence, you rethink about uh, your your story, for lack of a better word, again about the past. So, um, so that's that's kind of one of the ways I think about this thing. So, a, a very good example of this for world building, particularly in fantasy, is if you introduce an element like uh, battle magic, for example, where you have projectiles in a world that prior to this perhaps only had, didn't have um, ammunition in terms of like a gunpowder, then your construction in defense on the ground is gonna change. So if you have battle mages hurling fireballs, then you're gonna get uh, new kinds of wall structures in your fortresses. You're gonna get kind of what we call a pointed star um, feature. And stuff like, so you're, not, you're no longer going to present sort of big curved walls, but it's too easy to take down with a fireball. Um, you're gonna present angled sharp points and walls sure. because star force yeah. yeah exactly um and that's like just training your brain to think well i'm injecting uh, you know magic or i'm injecting a different kind of science into a world it it's not the world is not going to exist in stasis in relation to those elements it's going to have to evolve and change in order to react to them and that includes lots of things that, that's not just and again as an archaeologist that's not just um the behavior of people or the social structure but it's also physical objects and clothing. Um, another example would be if you have a magical system where hand gestures, uh, for example, like the magicians have, are key, then you might have a whole identification process where if somebody has their arms bare, that proves that they're a magic wielder. Or if they wear really long floaty sleeves that exaggerate the gestures, that might be another like, sort of indication. So the abilities that you give the people in your world and the way that you change it as a fantasist um, or as a science fictionist, <laughs> it impacts everything in, in like a really complicated and nuanced way. And I, I'm always really excited to think about that. And one of those ways is also the culture. So um, if you inject, for example, immortal characters into a universe, they're not going to think about day-to-day -day life in the way that the mayflies of humanity do. They're not going to have the same kind of morals and strictures in place, especially if we humans are their food source. Um, so I've always enjoyed kind of thinking about that, uh, where vampires and werewolves and such are, are concerned. I mean, one of the reasons I stuck them into England and made England the only country that in, during the Victorian era that has openly accepted these supernatural creatures in my universe. And that is why the British Empire exists, because uh, they employ vampires as intelligencers and spies and in sort of clever aspects of uh, empire expansion and domination, which vampires are very good at. Uh, and then they use werewolves for nighttime battle tactics, which if you don't accept those two elements, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So, you know, so I have a whole kind of fun thing. That, so you can play with things like that. And then again, uh, this can all guide sort of story arc and how you write and how you tell your stories um, in really fun and interesting ways. So. For me, kind of the world building is part and parcel of everything. It isn't just the structure in which my characters move. Um, it's all of this other stuff. And I think that's an archaeology thing. <laughs> it's very cool. And as I say, the, the worlds that you create are, are stunning. One of my favorite parts of the, the Parasol Protectorate, the, the first book, 
is um, the part where you say, you know, it's ridiculous that this small isle island would have a, an empire unless you take into account the the vampires and the werewolves. And I thought that was such a wonderful sort of historical <laughs> retcon. Yeah. You solve a mystery. Look at this pathetic, weeny little island. Why has it become a national power? An international power. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously vampires. Yes, I love that kind of thing. Like, like uh, another thing I have in my universe is that it, King Henry broke with the Catholic Church um, over acceptance of the supernatural. And yeah. the whole divorce thing was just a front. Because <laughs> this, this whole other argument, right? Things like that. I do it all the time in my universe. It's lots of fun. I mean, the other thing I retcon is whole ancient societies. So, for example, uh, the ancient Egyptians, clearly big fans of the werewolf and the shapeshifter in general. Otherwise, the god, you know, that's how they're gods. It's the Anubis <laughs> you know? form. Yeah. It's the Anubis form, exactly. Uh, stuff like that all the time. Whereas the Roman vampires, like, how else do you explain Caligula, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, Caligula definitely seems like a vampire that moved out of his territory. Ego <laughs> went completely nuts. Went bonkers. Oh, man. Yeah. Yep. Lost his crap. So <laughs> when you're starting with a new a new series or a new idea or a new concept, where do you start? Like, how do you how do you get that going? It, is, it often is a kind of intellectual thought exercise. So um, Alexia, who's the main character in my first series that we've referenced already, which is the Zola's book, um, and that kind of universe, sort of sprung because I was engaging in a in an apex predator, predator thought process. I was like, well, if you introduce vampires and werewolves as, as apex predators, there needs to be a biological control in place. So there's a reason that, for example, birds of, of prey only have one or two eggs. Um, whereas rabbits, for example, breed like rabbits. Um, right. And that's because, you know, food dynamics and balance right. and also, you know, so I'm very, pyramids. precisely. So if you have an apex predator hunting humans, what is it that's keeping them under control and not out, out breeding their food source? And so I came up with this idea that the bite is really hard. There are only, only alpha werewolves can bite and only vampire queens can bite in order to actually cause change. So I put all of these sort of restrictions in place, but I also wanted, uh, kind of character balance to that in terms of the world building. And so I invented this idea that there are these soulless people running around or preternaturals and the only ability they have, so they could they could run around and not even know that they have this ability, but the only ability they have is if they touch, physically touch a vampire or a werewolf, they can make them normal. They can make, make them, they ground them. They're like an electrical ground. So they, they, the vampires will lose all, they'll become human basically. And so will the werewolves. And that's it. And I just, so in other, I wanted to sort of write a character that like was unique and special in that way that urban fantasy often utilizes, but in this like really quirky way that all she can do is, is cancel out other people basically. Um, and it's kind of slightly inconvenient power on occasion, especially when all she is is hungry and she's like accidentally being attacked by a, a vampire. Um, so I can't remember how I got onto this. What was the original question? <laughs> how, do you, how do you start with a new, a new idea? How do I start a new one? So that's often how it starts, is I'm just kind of idly thinking about some sort of accepted uh, practice or theory in science or in uh, you know, ecology or archaeology or something. And I'm like, well, what if it's slightly different? I, I just just have a brain that kind of thinks that way, uh, I guess. It's why, it's why a lot of my, all of my stuff is also comedic. It's because my brain kind of just goes into a warp it uh, situation. Um, but like, like with this one, um, I was really interested in, I'm interested in the sort of, uh, anthropological cause in, in the United States, archeology span is part of the anthropology department. So interested in the anthropological approach to gender and how we study gender as sort of scientists and archeologists and anthropologists, um, opposed to how the conversation about gender is changing and evolving right now in this moment in time within the queer community. And I wanted to have a chat, I guess, in science fiction form about um, the imposition that expectations of biology put, like expectation of the human body or the alien body put, is put, like how that's put into a package by culture um, and how that affects the individual who's under the pressure of that packaging when they feel like they don't fit. And um, but of course, I'm doing it under the context of a murder investigation on a space station with an alien from a race with five genders and comedy. <laughs> and so, like, because why not? Um, 
but that that so I was I guess the, it, it started actually because I was thinking this is very obscure, but um I'm I read a lot of queer fiction and I read in the um gay romance category a lot quite a bit as well and there's a predilection for something called mpreg which is male pregnancy and it, <laughs> and it's not a trope that I particularly enjoy reading for but I was interested in unpacking the psychology of developing that um and so this is also kind of a tiny little conversation with that concept as well and that's how it started as I was thinking about like why is this tiny subgenre so popular and what is it that the like reader draw to this or the writer draw to this um and how does that tie into queer identity because it's a lot of straight women reading and writing these books and so on and so forth so um a lot of stuff that just kind of percolated in my brain and then I literally spat this book out in like a, a couple of weeks it was one of the fastest books I've ever written because wow. clearly my subconscious had a lot to say on that subject <laughs> So what's your what's your process like when you're writing a book? I'm sorry, this must be the most boring question, but I'm always fascinated because authors have such different processes. And whenever I interview somebody, they come up with something completely new. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's not how I do it. Or anybody else I've talked to have done it. It really depends on the book. Like, it, it really, really honestly does. So I just did a count. And this is my 20, this is my 20, depending on how you count, because I have like some graphic novels and stuff like that. This is somewhere between 21 and 25 for me in the past 10 years. And so, which is not like as fast as some people can write. Let's be clear about that. But um, I'm I'm pretty pleased with myself. It's amazing. It's incredible. thank you. Um, she says, massaging her hands. Um, <laughs> uh, what was I going with this? What, what was the question? Oh, shoot. Uh, See, I'm process. brain fried. Everybody, is that your process when you? Oh, my write. process. Um, so most of the time, with the exception of this one and a couple of others. I tend to be a, an actual, I'm a strict outliner. I like an outline. I like to know where the story is going. And I, I like to have the bones and the structures and the beats in place. It doesn't have to be a very meticulous outline, but I like to have an outline. Um, and that's partly because I think, because essentially at root, everything I write is, is a comedy of manner. And those can be very slow. Yeah. So um, yeah, I like to say that something explodes, all of my characters run around and then they sit down, have tea and talk about it. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily make for a suspenseful novel. Um, so, uh, so I'm very concerned about pace, not plot pace, uh, although plot is a vehicle to pace. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so I like to have an outline that kind of keeps me on pace, so that I know what might need some an injection of pacing technique. And pacing technique could be a, a romantic drop, like the first kiss. Um, it can be something exploding, like a plot device. Uh, or it can be humor. Humor is also a really good instrument of pacing. So, um, so my outlines are kind of a jumble of these sorts of things with a like, oh, funny bit here, you know, like, uh, put a Lord, Lord Uncle Dom is one of my most popular characters. He's my funny, one of my funniest characters. He's a side character that appears in a lot of my stuff. So I could, like, sort Lord Uncle Dom scene here, because I know that will move things along. Um, so that's kind of what my outlines are like. And so that's like how I write as a writer. I tend to, only be able to work on one major series at a time. I can jump and write little novellas and stuff off the side, but I will only ever be working on the rough draft of one book at a time. And I can't and won't pick up another book until that rough draft is done. Sure. Um, yeah, and so um, a rough draft usually takes me anything, depending on how long it is, um, and depending on, you know, sort of it's in normal for me is writing every day, every weekday, um, around 2 p.m. in the afternoon until I've finished my word count, which is 2,000 words a day. Um, I am a spit it out as fast as I can rough draft writer, and then because I know I can always edit it later. And for me, the rough draft is the hardest part, so I need to just push myself to get it out. The best thing for me as a writer is actually writing retreats. I'm a competitive writer, so I like writing with other writers sitting across the table from me. And so uh, those I can go much faster, but I kind of warm up to it. So I'll do like 4,000 the first day, six the next, and then I can have sort of 8,000 for days to 10, like the rest of that run. And then so your fingers can, are bleeding stumps. Surely. I know, but I can get 40,000 words done in one week writing retreat, which is a whole novella. Yeah. Um, and that's great. Uh, so I, I try to do as many writing retreats as I can possibly can um in the year so i'm always looking for a new one to go do and join nice that's that's pretty much how i do it 
and then the drafting process I guess yeah and then I'm a rewriter so it will take me as long to rewrite as it will to write something but that's fine because it's written and the rewriting process I actually really enjoy I love the editing process so um depending on whether it's an independent book a, a self-publishing book published book or whether it's a traditionally published book I I always go to a developmental editor or my actual editor at my publishing house um and then I have beta readers um, who are mostly in-world continuity checks when you have funny books in the same universe. <laughs> yeah. I can't keep track of it all myself. Of course. Um, and yes, I, have, I do use sensitivity readers quite a bit. So um, so this book has a, what amounts to, and and my next, this book, um, which is, this is the Custer Protocol series. So this is the third book in that series and the fourth and last one comes out in August. Um, has uh, some trans characters in it, so I, I have um, friends who are trans who read those for me. Um, yeah, I try and get like the next book is set in Japan, so I also hired a. Uh, it's during the Meiji Restoration, which is not my particular expertise. So I found myself uh, a retired professor in Japan who read English well enough to double check that section of the for me and stuff like that. So um, so I try to. That means when I'm under a deadline from a publisher, because I take all of that responsibility on myself. Frankly, I just don't trust them to do it. Um, and I can't afford to do it at this point in my career. So I tried to actually finish a book very early, well before the due date, so that I have time to make sure I have sensitivity readers and historical checks and all that sort of thing happen. Um, I still make mistakes. You know, you can't check everything. There's things I don't know to check, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I do the best that I can to, to make sure that it's at least as honest as I can make it. Um, right. Of course. No, no. And that's a, and that's a really, sorry. And as kind as I can make it, I, I write what I like to call kind of like comfort. I call them comfort reads, but also I want my books to be hugs. I want people to leave my books with a big fat grin on their face. Aww. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to leave anybody unhappy. I, I'm a, a big fan of like books or, or entertainment and, and mine are particularly lighthearted, <laughs> even if it's a murder mystery. Um, so I, I try to, um, I don't want to leave people like too upset ever. Um, and that's just a person, that's my style and my brand and the way I write. So yeah, of course, of course. And it, that's, that's really beautiful. That's a really beautiful sort of aim to, to make the world a slightly more beautiful smiley place i love that that's, yeah. that's amazing. yeah it isn't everybody though i mean i i understand a lot of people write dark and gritty and really would rather people like their readers think hard about something or, or sob quietly in a corner and i will I'm do that on you, occasion. Uh, yeah i will do that on occasion but I, I like one of my like i actually like to joke speaking of george that if you stuck us in an elevator together it might explode because it's like anti-matter and, and matter <laughs> together right um but yeah i i'm that i'm the antidote to all of those things and that's kind of the one contract i have with my readers is that I, I, like I, I feel like occasionally especially with a series they'll get very worried in the middle and i just want to be like take their hand it'll, it'll be okay in the end like trust me it'll all be okay <laughs> I love that. So um, one of my questions actually that I, I wrote in advance is what advice do you have for authors who want to start incorporating LGBT elements into their writing, uh, particularly with a view to sensitivity? Because if people are not LGBT themselves, but they want to be representative, representing the, the LGBT agenda, what yeah. advice would you give them? Well, this is an interesting one. And it's it's kind of the same advice that I would use if you want to be a bit more supportive in terms of feminism um and it's i call this the um show me your doctor uh advice which is essentially if you are going to put anyone in a position of power in your books think very very carefully about whether that person needs to be a older straight white male because most of the time they don't uh and i'm thinking I mean, this is advice i give to romance writers in particular but um and this i don't think this is tokenism um because the idea is that you put uh people of color or people who are queer into positions of authority and just as part of the coloring of your universe and that's just a way to write 
what we all hope might be the future kind of into existence. Um, and, and it's more just a training mechanism for your brain as an author to be like, oh, I have this bias. When I introduce a doctor character, it's always a dude. When I introduce, you know, a nobleman who owns a palatial estate, it's always an old white guy, right? And it just doesn't, doesn't have to be. It can be something else. Um, and so if you just start training your brain to think about that a little bit more carefully, um, you'll find it comes more and more naturally to you to just cross-check yourself. Um, so yeah, it's the, 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 I, the, the, I call it the show me your doctor <laughs> trope, which is like, give me a gay black lesbian doctor. <laughs> that, like, it's not, it's not difficult. You can do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. How do you reconcile that with something like steampunk where, um, cause I mean, the problem with steampunk, of course, is that it's set in the 19th century, 19th century England was very colonialism, <laughs> imperialism, very, very what well, it's not as wide as you think it is. So that's the first thing, especially like Victorian era, um, yeah. especially not London. Yeah, that's true. Um, Samuel College, Taylor, these, these people. Yeah. But to be honest, what's now, I mean, steampunk is fading, uh, and what's selling and what people are interested in reading is more diverse steampunk anyway. So leave England. I mean, I, I obviously, I do that now, right? I, this, this is the, the, my first series is mostly in England and Europe. That was five years ago. Uh, the last one, maybe, maybe even six years ago at this juncture. And this series is intentionally going out and visiting other parts of the now crumbling British Empire. And perhaps it's not a bad thing that it's crumbling. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you're going to write steampunk, it doesn't, there's nothing in the rule book that says it has to be in England. Yeah. Um, not anymore, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see other voices in steampunk in particular. Um, it, it's just that the word itself doesn't necessarily imply that it has to be a Victorian setting. Some of the best steampunk is, you know, coming out of Japan, for example, now um, animated. But... Yeah, there's lots of places where uh, retro futurism can be written, and it would be exciting to read about. Sure. So dig deep. Familiar with. Yeah. Just move. Just move. <laughs> move locations. <laughs> I mean, there's a bit. Twice the Cal writes a kind of Carib Caribbean steampunk in space, you know. Uh, so on a, you know, a retro futurism planet. So it doesn't. Yeah. That there's there's, the field is open. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great piece of advice. I am going to say, after that wonderful piece of advice, that we are going to go for a very short break. We're going to take a couple of minutes to have a little natter. And I suggest that you guys ask your questions, because we will be answering your questions at the end of this stream. That's in about 15 or 20 minutes. We'll start those. So get your questions in for the amazing Gail Carriger. I love and, it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we will be back with you very shortly. Bye bye. And we're back, at least I assume we are, because the voices told me so. Guys, I have seen your questions pouring in. Thank you so much for those. There are some fascinating things that I can't wait to get to. But first, I have possibly the ultimate question. Here we go. What is the number one mistake? And I'm not asking you to dish dirt and name names. I'm asking you <laughs> to help us improve, all of us. What is the number one mistake you see in other people's writing when they approach the LGBT plus aspects? Uh, well, the biggest one, I think, um, because I do read a lot of romance, is imposing a sort of heteronormative idea onto gay relationships. So right. um, this idea that one of them has to be the guy and one of them has to be the girl um, right. is pretty endemic. Um, and so... One of my favorite sayings, and, and even if you're not writing romance, you will probably have a romantic thread at some point, unless you're writing ace characters, I suppose, or, or aromantics. But uh, that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> the is that um, everything in life is about sex, except sex, which is about power. So um, that is actually what you're writing when you're writing two romantic characters together when they're queer or hat but that power like uh what's the word i'm looking for that that power structure that that heterosexual normative relationships have is not the same power structure that most queer relationships have so just considering that um you know that the the a guy who's quite femmy could be the top in bed for example or uh um the butch lesbian is really really bad with tools you know like 
just there's a lot of stereotypes that um that had people think about uh and think exact like re they want to reflect their own identity onto a queer relationship identity and it's, it's it isn't the same it's different there are some that fit the model but generally speaking it's way more varied and it, like complex than that and interesting and exciting um another like from a writer perspective uh, that very fact when you have two women in a relationship or two men is means that you have to talk about all of these things you have to talk about what you like in bed generally speaking you need to talk about how you uh, uh define monogamy you have to how you talk about how you define the relationship so communication is really really key which is great for authors because that means dialogue that's really exciting <laughs> to write um and then the last thing is that in with queer characters in particular found family is also really really important um and i actually believe this is important in general for writers is to kind of write that motif more com like give your characters friends friends who don't betray them friends who are for example the same sexual identity but plutonic so like your your male if you have a straight male main character he should have a female friend who is also straight <laughs> who is just a friend. That's just a really rare and important model that I think ought to be in more fiction. And maybe I'm just like slamming the hammer down on people and nobody's interested in writing this sort of thing. But um, if writing queer teaches us anything, it's the importance of found family and the importance of like sort of communication in, in the context of relationships and the importance of friendships and support from friendships and friendships that are defined as family. And I wish in general, I just read and saw more of that in all fiction. Um, but in sort of science fiction and, and fantasy in particular, I think. So, yeah, there's my little diet. I'll get down off my pedestal. I like pedestal, my soapbox now. No, no, it's it's very valuable. And I mean, as somebody who, so I don't read a huge amount of romance, um, but as somebody who reads heavily in that in that area and reads heavily within, particularly within queer romance, you know, you must see everything. You must see it done well. You must see it done yes. badly. So yes. what would be your advice for, for example, um, if we have straight people in the audience, what would be your advice for helping them learn more about queer relationships, help, help them represent queer relationships better? I think, I hate to say it, but like speaking to audience members who are not romance writers, you need to read romance. Um, the best romance out there is doing a really good job at this. Um, so, and I know it's kind of, that's like saying, go read more sci-fi to someone who doesn't normally read sci-fi. How do you start? Where do you start? But there are some really good um, posts out there coming out of bloggers like Book Riot. Um, Book Riot has had some great, uh, they did a really good own voices post recently, which was like um, a bunch of romance novellas that included um, all kinds of diversity, not just queer diversity, but examples of like really well-written romances that were short, so they're not a big tie-on. 30, you know, 30 to 40 K, it's, it's really not a lot to read, um, but we're good representative romances of female, female, of male, male. Um, and then there are authors like me who, because I write so much queer, because I'm part of the queer community, I consider it kind of like bound and determined to wreck as many queer books as possible. Um, so I actually have a blog post right now that has a bunch of queer sci-fi recommendations because I just wrote queer sci-fi, but I also just did one that has a bunch of like, all different kinds of gender um, explorations, all, mostly out of the romance community. So um, if anybody's interested in those, I can pop those links. But if you just go to my website, to, the, to my blog section, you know, it's like some of the more recent blog posts and it's pretty clear by the title what I'm talking about. And I'm afraid that is your answer. Like I know all of us are strapped for time, but um, just do a little bit of reading. And, and again, romance doesn't tend to run as long as science fiction and fantasy anyway. Um, but the the best written romance can teach you so much. I mean, even if you find the sex a little too graphic or what have you, like, let me tell you, one of the hardest things to write in the universe is a really good sex scene. Um, and if you're even modestly considering sticking something like that into one of your books, you really should read some romance who can do it properly uh, because it is an art form. So like reading widely is, a, is an opportunity to to learn and to better your own um, ability to handle these sorts of things and and man like there there's some really good romance out there these days um and it's yeah. not again it's not a big buy-in <laughs> to yeah. do it yeah um, so, and um i would say sorry i 
just sorry, no, just go on. want to jump in here. I would say that um, even for world builders who are not necessarily authors, it's a really valuable way to understand a little bit the dynamics of those relationships, because we all know, I'm looking at you, Anthony and Cleopatra, that relationships <laughs> can have major impact on the worlds that you are building. Relationships can move mountains or at least borders. So it definitely is worth looking into these things and understanding what makes these relationships tick a little bit so that you can represent those in your own world and so that you can then understand the knock-on effects that they might have. Just, I mean, that's my soapbox. I'm lost. Speaking of George R.R. Martin, like basically all those books are about is who's sleeping with who at any given time, right? Exactly. And why it's about the world. <laughs> with dragons. But, you know, um, yeah, I like to call this literally the sins of the father or the sins of the mother. Like if you have a, a grandmother or a father figure or whatever who like screwed with the wrong person, <laughs> shall we say, uh, it can have wide scale repercussions, re yeah. repercussions that you can deal with as a writer. Also reproductions. You're also <laughs> depending what kind of screwing went on <laughs> um another thing that i do is i followed like tons of um own voices bloggers and that sort of thing within the community so another again this is mostly geared towards uh gender conversations about gender and gender representation um but i just did a big uh non-fiction resources that included some bloggers and a bunch of other stuff that i looked into and read about and did before i did the fifth gender um that also is up on my blog. So uh, if you just can't bear the idea of reading outside of your genre, um, there are all, nonfiction is your other recourse, of course. Uh, as you should always, be reading outside your genre. You should be. I think right nothing healthier. Like yeah, I think so. Um, man, you can learn, for example, so much about pacing properly if you are reading a really good pulp writer from the 1950s, like John D. McDonald. Um, and, and I am not a mystery person, but boy is his pacing spot on. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from reading outside of your genre. And you can train your brain to read for for your writer education, to read fiction for a writer education, um, as opposed to read it for your own pleasure as a reader. Be careful yeah. though. I mean, you, you might, ever, it might never turn your analytical brain off again. <laughs> Therein lies the danger. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That is a, a very good warning, honestly. <laughs> um, good. We are drawing ever onwards and I will have to tackle these questions. Let's but do of it. course, I need to ask you, what are you working on now? Oh, right now, actually. Right now I'm writing nonfiction. Uh, speaking of like challenging yourself, uh, an early podcaster I really love says you should move in the direction of greatest courage. Um, which like is a little challenging if you're intrinsically lazy like me. Uh, and I keep- There's the woman who's published 25 <laughs> books. 25, 25 <laughs> people. It's just me battling like my inclination towards inertia. I uh, must keep writing because if I stop, I'll never start up again. Um, I, so I uh, obviously, if you can't guess this, have a slightly feminist bent as well to a lot of my stuff. And I read widely and love and adore the heroine's journey. Um, and I talk about it quite a bit. I've talked about it on panels. I talk about it on interviews and stuff. And there's well-known uh, research and discussion and beats and breakdowns of the hero's journey. And there's almost none from a writer perspective of the heroine's journey. There's some Jungian analysis, which I'm really not into. But, um, and so I've kind of been waiting for someone to write the beats down, to analyze it, to present the core myths, much in the way that Campbell did. Um, and it hasn't happened. And so finally I was like, well, I guess I have to do that. So right now I'm working on the heroine's journey for writers, which is just a, a study on the um, tropes, archetypes, and the beats of the heroine's journey and presenting it in such a way that hopefully people will understand and be able to apply and figure out why some things are successful and some things aren't in the zeitgeist. And yeah, so I analyze some pop culture as well. And yeah, and it also has a little bit of a conversation about gender um, also, because one of the first and most core principles, of course, is that um, the heroine's journey and the hero and the hero's journey and the heroine's journey are divorced from biology. So a woman can undertake the hero's journey, see the most recent uh, Wonder Woman movie, and a man can undertake the heroine's journey, see Harry Potter. Uh, so... Yeah, so that's what this book is about. And I'm mostly writing it because I'm exhausted by not having a resource to point people towards. And so I was just like, okay, I guess I have to write that resource. 
Ah, so we'll see. I am so thrilled to hear that. I am so excited to read that. Damn it. Right faster, woman. <laughs> <laughs> Going as fast as I can. Um, yeah, I'm actually pretty excited about it. People seem really interested in it, and I hope I can do it justice. Uh, but part of the book is just a call out to be like, well, look, if you don't agree with me, or you think there are myths I didn't address, or what have you, then please, more people write about this. Um, I'm sort of desperate for it to be as big a deal as the hero's journey is. Right, of course. And it's it's a much neglected, a much, much neglected. neglected aspect that really does need to be brought to the fore. Yeah. And both of these journeys tie very heavily into like, especially Western culture's assessment of what masculine and feminine means and expectations that are imposed upon men or women in our society. Men are expected to kind of be the hero in terms of like solitary and conquering and you do it on your own or, you know, not the not at all and no wolf i poop in the woods uh, all these and, things and success is defined by lopping off somebody's head right and getting thrown um and women are defined by a lot of what's endemic to the heroine's journey which is networking and doling out achievements and rel and establishing friendship networks and like building a cohesion that allows you to beat the odds and um unify your family and and so I and I feel like those two models have kind of damaged society a little bit as well. So there's there's also a little bit of social commentary in the book. I am so looking forward to reading that. All right, my producer is going to yell at me if we don't get to these questions. So our first question here from Pathetic Barrel: How do you prefer to see straight writers write LGBT characters? As a straight Christian who wants to have real diverse characters in their world. How do I do this without royally ruffling it up? And I, I had to read it for that that alone, royally ruffling it up, made me very happy. Now this is something we've touched on a little bit already, but I, I just thought that was a very, very good question to start with. So back to the positions of power. So when you're, col when you're people in your world and you're coloring it, just make sure when you are putting characters into positions of power over other characters, like authority, voices of authority in terms of information or, um, or actual authority, physical authority, generals, what have you, just think very carefully about what uh, identity those characters have and why, why they, what, what, who they have to be, what they don't have to be. Um, like, uh, there are pitfalls to avoid, like, um, like tokenism. So, like, and by that I mean is like non-sexually representing queer characters as like the gay best friend whose only identity is to be the gay best friend who doesn't seem to have, who kind of exists cut cloth and doesn't seem to have his own or her own identity in terms of love interests and a life and um but you should be considering that whenever you, you want complex characters i should hope um around your main character who are all on their own paths and on their own journeys and identities so that that's one way to to make your world more realistic and complex um and then the same pitfalls as you might approach when you're attempting to be more um gender inclusive with women in your books which is don't kill us off <laughs> don't yes. kill off your queers don't kill off your women <laughs> like it's okay we we're, we don't have to be a plot point we don't we don't need to die to uh give your hero motivation so those are um it's you know who you can kill you can kill um the white brother a <laughs> straight white brother or what have you like kill somebody else off uh don't kill us all the time we're tired of dying uh to motivate the straights um so yeah those are a couple of couple of ways to do it and like come back to conversation and, and dialogue and and again you you will probably need to find a beta reader who is from the community that you are representing and who's willing to do it uh, but trust me you're related to someone who's queer in some way or another and they will know other queer folk who might be willing to re read a version of your book for you for correct representation but have your characters have the same kind of questioning and conversations that you might be having Amazing, amazing. That's some really um, incredible, solid advice. Thank you. I have a question here from Zamwich. How do you go about finding a sensitivity reader for something, for writing something you haven't experienced? So they want to write a story with a trans character and um, they want to make sure that the experience is authentic. And this leads into another question, which is how do you find sensitivity readers if the group you're writing, you're writing about in your book isn't represented in your group of friends? So yeah that's the same question really yeah uh because my answer is i go to my friends and that's a rough one um you can hire sensitivity readers and that's probably what you'll end up having to do 
there are, uh, I think if you just Google like how to hire a sensitivity reader, there are a couple of really good articles out there. There are resources like podcasts and things um, that, and I'm sorry, I just can't pull a link off of the top of my head, but there are definitely like blog posts and resources out there, which basically are designed to pair you up for a fee. And I, you're probably looking at a couple hundred bucks at um, minimum, but it will be worth it. Trust me to fight the Twitter storm of, from hell that's coming down upon you if you don't get it right. Um, and and it's worth it. Like if you're essentially utilizing elements of a community for your own product, which is what your book is, um, then you should pay out to that community um, for their life experiences. Um, and you know, and the same thing if you're dealing with a, dis a character that has a disability that you're not, um, you know, that you're not intimately familiar with, and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, there are readers for all of those things that can be hired, and that's probably where you will need to go uh, if you don't have friends who can who can hook you up with other friends. Right. Absolutely. And there's um, also local resources. I mean, every community has a local LGBTQ plus. Um, community center or community workspace and or there's also your library that you can go to um there are meetups and meetings and all that sort of thing where you can go and if you're an ally and if you're positive and if you're kind um you can and, and if you're willing to um, take advice then you can go and and be gentle in someone else's safe space and say hey i, I don't really have any other resource I'm trying to write good representation can you help me with anything? And they might not know directly, but they'll put you on to someone who put you on to someone who put you on to someone. Um, I think all of us are hoping for more and better representation in general. So, um, so uh, hopefully you also will encounter um, a support network that, that's willing to step forward and help you out. Um, just realize that you're coming from a place of, of authority and danger, especially if you're a straight white man. Um, and that means you're a threat, especially in these spaces. So generally kind of libraries and, um, and online communities and, and hiring a reader is probably your best first approach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just to be clear, straight white men are not a th are not actually a threat, but they are often the, the form in which threat comes. Yes. So there is a learned experience there. I just, I feel that very yeah. important. I have a lot of friends who are straight white men who are experiencing the gender revolution um, <laughs> as a, a scary thing because they feel suddenly victimized even though they personally have not done anything wrong and i just i just i find it so important to put that out there it is the shape of your packaging that <laughs> has previously threatened a lot of people and they yeah. feel defensive towards you it is not yeah. anything you have done wrong no well maybe well, <laughs> you never know <laughs> I mean, uh, not I mean, my friends, not at all. You know, <laughs> I'm very lucky. But um, it's that yeah. old saying, which is, um, as a general rule, straight white men are afraid of being embarrassed, and the rest of us are afraid of being killed. So um, that's the dynamic that's in play, and it's just uh, thirty thousand years of um, training in our bones and DR DNA, mostly speaking as a woman from that perspective. But um, so you know, that's just we're scared like most of us in the queer community in particular walk around scared a lot of the time especially if you present in a way that's visually very queer and um and we're scared <laughs> of you sorry guys um and and it's just a it's a battle for everybody to overcome that um, i have faith i think we're gonna get <laughs> i hope I, so I, I writing think... writing these positive things into fiction and into our narratives is one of the way that we conquer this that's and how we change the narrative yeah that, exactly and that's us i mean this is we are custodians uh, right now all of you writers me you everybody out there we are custodians of narrative which is one of the most powerful things we have as human beings on this planet yeah. um sci-fi fantasy it doesn't matter um and so doing this like putting positive representations of queer like fighting this fight it, it's a noble fight to take and like you straight white men are applauded for for taking this on and attempting to do it with due diligence and um with nobility but it is a it is a responsibility 
Um, I, I feel it very, very keenly. And it's a hard responsibility because of the risk of being called out for it and the risk of, of being embarrassed. Um, but it's our, I think it's my duty as an author um, to do certain things. Um, and because I am a comedy author, and because like I said, I like to leave people smiling, um, the ability to give what what I call all of my queer babies, all of these new genders and new genders, all of the, not new, all of these voiced identities that are coming to the fore right now to give them space on the page um, is my honor and my privilege, but also to give them happiness on the page, which for so many of us is not something we've had. Um, or have gotten to have it, it's a way of writing the future that you want into existence yeah that is that is beautiful that is really beautiful thank you for that um i'm gonna step away from lgbt for a moment and i'm gonna ask pixie or power pixie or powers question which <laughs> is when starting world building does it snowball into existence or do you have the final picture in your mind first and then plot the steps to get there we talked a little bit about your process but this is sort of how does it arrive? It for me it comes along. So like for my steampunk world, for example, like I kind of kind of developed the London one and then it sort of expanded out to encompass the rest of the world. Um, I'm kind of torn as to whether I like going for it, like creating a I'm working on a, a possible new YA novel and I'm actually writing kind of most of that world into existence and that magical system into existence first before I, or or as I write the first book so that it expands um, because you know this is an old Douglas Adams saying which is never blow up the world in chapter one because you might need it later so like <laughs> you never know as you're writing the rules to your universe or your magical system or what have you you might have to break it in book three uh, after book one has already been on the shelves for several years for example <laughs> um, hmm says the girl who might or might not have done that uh, so like there's an inherent like pitfall and danger in both and the pitfall in the second option of writing the whole world is that writers just like to invent stuff. And so we could spend all of our time just writing the world and never actually writing the story in the world, which doesn't do anybody any good unless you're a dungeon master, in which case I applaud you, go forth and be a dungeon master, but you're not an author under those circumstances. And if what you want to be is a published author with a book on the shelf, then you actually have to write the story. Um, so I guess I would urge it or encourage a balance of the two because uh, you don't want to get too caught up in world building that you forget to write the actual book awesome all right we are pulling up to an hour so gail any final words on all the many things we've talked about today no i guess i just uh I, i'm glad there were so many questions and so many people here um on this topic and i really appreciate everybody's eyeballs um yeah go for it uh, People your worlds with queer folk, like, yay, <laughs> we have a revolution. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't think I have uh, much else to say. You can find me online. You can find my articles. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll link you all. I'll link them to you guys. And you can put them in the um, comments or what have you. Um, we already yeah. have gailcarriger.com, your website. You can find Gail Carriger at Gail Carriger on Twitter. And you can find her books at gailcarriger.com forward slash books and Those also are... speaking of the queer community i'm also on tumblr which is where i get queerest because of tumblr uh i don't know if anyone's still left there but uh yeah you can find me all over and i own my seo so just google my name it's g-a-i-l yeah perfect perfect <laughs> all right so you can find gail in all these places she's incredible i think i cannot wait to read her new book i might go buy it on my kindle right now <laughs> right the minute we're done because i'm so curious about the fifth gender i want to learn more your elevator pitch did the job completely <laughs> um, so gail thank you so very much for coming to talk to us today thanks for having me on it's been a real pleasure